check, check. Well, good evening, everybody. How you doing? Good, good. We want to get started tonight. Thank you for being here. And uh, we're going to get into our, our study in just a few moments. I'm going to ask if, uh, if I could have our ushers to assist us uh, this evening. We're going to receive the offering. Um, just one real big special prayer need. Brother Doug Jones, I don't know if you got a text yesterday from anyone, but uh, he, he fell at the assisted living place um, and, and, and hit his ear on something, had to go to the hospital and get some stitches. And, and so he, he, they took him to ER, took care of that, and, and he's back last evening. I went and uh, sat with him while he ate his lunch today. We just need to pray, pray for him, um, for the Lord to cause us to have a speedy recovery in his healing um, and uh, just just pray for Sister Alma. Is there there are times Brother Doug in our conversation knows who I am, and then there's times he don't know who I am, and we're still in the same conversation. And uh, if I say something, he, he'll say, "Well, how's your daddy?" I said, "Well, he retired." Yeah, I knew that. Somebody told me. I said I'm pastoring the church now. He goes, "Yeah, yeah, I heard that." And um, and then he'll he'll jump from there to talking CPA stuff and, and helping me file delinquent taxes. And so let's just pray for him. Um, he's such a, such a great guy and just needs, uh, needs us to remember them in prayer. So let's remember that, that special prayer need. Um, I believe Russell's doing better from, we prayed for him. He was having some diverticulitis or something going on and God has moved on his behalf and brought some healing there. And I'm grateful to the Lord for that. Um, Sister Blaylock come in, and, and we've been praying for little Elijah. He had been sick, had a fever. His white blood counts weren't right, and he's got some diabetic things going on too. But it's like God is just moving in his life and bring some healing. He's gained some weight. He's gr grown four inches, and and so uh, he's he's he, he's picking up. He's becoming a young man, and so um, that's another praise report. A lot of times, if we're not careful, we'll spend more time talking about the prayer needs and not thanking God for what we've already prayed about that he's answered. And so I, I felt like I needed to insert those. And maybe you've got a win. I'm going to call it a win, a W-I-N, a win, where you've prayed or we've prayed and you had a situation and God just divinely intervened in the situation. Anybody? Um, at one time, I know we were praying for Sister Lily's brother. Uh, I don't know how the situation is going with that. We'll continue to praise on our men's prayer list. Much better, praise the Lord. Any other prayer needs before we uh, have the ushers to come up that anybody wants to mention? Yes, Brother Mike was saying Sister Judy is not feeling well this evening. And uh, I tell you what, even if you're not sick, when you have to get out in the mess we've had the last few days, almost off and on for the last two weeks, it almost, almost makes you feel bad. We need to pray for the people in Seattle. They see this all the time and uh, in, in England. So... Um, Great Britain, areas like that. Anybody else? Special prayer need? Sister Judy, um, let's remember um, those that have lost love and Brother Bill Woodard, um, Sister Faye Stevens, Sister Annie Watkins, the family member she's lost. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Ushers, would you come forward? We're going to ask God to just uh, be with us tonight, and uh, we're going to get into our study. So. <clears throat> maybe mix it up a little bit we, we try not to put too many folks on the spot but brother Larry would you mind just praying a prayer of thanks over this prayer and these prayer needs and then pray over the offering brother would you please thank you Amen. Amen. In just a few moments, uh, we'll have the, uh, the outlines to you guys. It was kind of an oversight and didn't get those printed as yet, but they're being printed as we speak. They're going to be hot off the press, those outlines. 
And uh, can you can you read that okay? Uh, actually, uh, trying to I can't catch up with Sister Ellen by no stretch of the imagination, but I did create this. Uh, actually, created on my iPad and uh, was able to convert it to a PowerPoint from what they call a keynote. So. Um, if it's messed up, we'll blame somebody that's not here. And if, I, if it's good, then uh, I'll take the credit. Yeah, so that's, that's how we'll do that. But tonight we're going to be talking about fighting the good fight. And it's, it's chapter two of fighting the good fight. And uh, I'm just going to start through the introduction. And uh, hopefully in just a few moments we'll have those outlines. But uh, as we talk about Jesus, our model for warfare uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke share the account of Jesus and his temptation in the wilderness, um, uh, uh, where he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be 40, 40 days prayer and fast and be tempted of the devil. Mark puts it this way in Mark 1, 12 and 13. It says, and immediately the Spirit drove, drove him or driveth him into the wilderness, and he was there uh, in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan. And was with the wild beast, and the angels ministered to him. I'm going to read that again um, because Matthew, uh, Matthew, and Luke in particular says Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, whereas Mark says that the Holy Spirit drove him um, into the wilderness. It was a compelling, a compulsion by the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says to be tempted. 40 days of the devil. Now, we do read some of the gospel accounts, and this is something in my studies that I found out. Some of them said Jesus prayed and fasted for 40 days, and afterward he was hungered, and then the devil come to him. And I've always had that image in my mind, but when you read all of the gospels, you read that he was led by the Spirit to, into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil for 40 days, is how the scripture reads. If you read it differently than what I, maybe I'm misinterpreting, but that's what I saw. So uh, I got from that, maybe we'll hit on that in just a little bit, that there are times, not that God tempts us, but to temper us, there are times God will lead us into Areas that are um, a challenge to our faith. We read that in the, the 23rd Psalm. And he talked about the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And all that's real good stuff. That sounds like the fluff side of serving God. And then, yea, though I walk through the valley in the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Then when we get there, the whole picture changes. And if you read different places in the Psalms, you'll see that the Psalmist David talks about uh, the road rough, rugged uh, things that he's gone through. Sometimes you'll read where he said um, that he wet his bed with his tears all night long. Anybody ever remember him reading that? So we read those wonderful, triumphant, God's with me, victorious times in the book of Psalms, but we also read David being honest with us about that there are times of trials. And Psalm 51 talked about his transgressions and his iniquities and how he had failed God against you only, Lord, have I sinned and Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly and cleanse me from all my sins. And so he's letting us know that temptations and trials come to the believer. Um, I'm going to read Matthew chapter 4 verses 1 through 11. I tried to break it up in a different, uh, because sometimes from one computer to the next computer to the projector, it'll throw part of the image off the screen. So we tried to correct that. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. And the Bible says, And Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he hunger, He was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he, but he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone." Then verse 7, Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, 
It's just like the devil. He just don't know when to quit, does he? He just keeps coming and coming. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. I've never really, it never jumped out at me like these next three words, and their glory. There is glory. There is the sparkle, the glitter, uh, the glamour of the kingdoms of the world. The scripture says that there's pleasure in sin, but it's for a season. And that's what he's saying here. The kingdoms of the world and their glory, but it's temporary. He said, and all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. It's not in our notes, but I want to throw this out there. How can the devil give the world to the one who actually created it? Have you ever thought about that before? How can the devil give the world back to the one who actually spoke it into existence? But sometimes there are some that are just the, right out of doofus. Uh, that's all I'm going to say. And Jesus said, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Now, I'm going to read the Mark passage of Mark 1, 12 and 13. Did I give you that too, brother? Okay. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And this word immediately ties his baptism into his wilderness experience. But take this in, in, in consideration. Understand baptism in, in, in the water, the Holy Spirit descended upon him as a dove, baptism in the Holy Spirit. Immediately the Holy Spirit drives him into the wilderness. This is at the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. It was in preparation for him to do great things for the Father. He was there in the wilderness 40 days tempted by Satan and was with the wild beasts. Look at what it says there. And the angels ministered to him. So we want to first address this setting in which Jesus was thrust by the Holy Spirit. Um, I, I believe that we could use a little more positive faith uh, in classical Pentecostal realms because in classical Pentecostal churches and some of our nominal churches because there's some that don't believe anymore in miracles. They don't believe that God can heal. They don't believe, they'll, they'll get in their pulpits and spend valuable pulpit time damning Pentecostals because of our belief in tongues, interpretation of tongues and miracles and wonders and signs. Die with the apostles says they say that we are heretics and that's not the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus warned us in the word about that. Um, uh, so as we think about where Jesus was in the setting in which he was thrust by the Holy Spirit, uh, he was thrust into the wilderness not everything that we go through is going to be pie in the sky by and by. There's going to be things we go through that challenge our faith. But neither can we take some kind of uh, prosperity approach where we're little gods under God and nothing is ever going to go wrong because if you got enough faith, you're going to never be sick and your children are always going to be saved and your grandparents aren't going to die and they teach this kind of stuff but, but then it still happens to good, godly, faith spirit-filled believers and the reason being is we're in this world. And we're going to face those things. Jesus, we're going to have wilderness settings. Let's talk about that wilderness setting. Uh, traditionally, uh, biblical historians will say that this uh, wilderness temptation, this wilderness setting was near Jericho. Um, according to Mark chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, uh, there were wild beasts there. So historians say that those wild beasts in that part of the world, there were jackals and wolves, wild boar, um, and, and, and many other wild creatures. So physically, Jesus didn't just have to deal with hunger. He didn't just have to deal with uh, the headache that comes with being hungry. Uh, it didn't just have to deal with the thirst and dehydration in his body. He also had to physically, as, a, as the God-man, had to deal with the fact that there were wolves and jackals and other wild animals that could 
destroy his body. Okay, uh, so let's think about this setting in which Jesus has been thrust. It was a dangerous place to be. It was comfortless. I don't think they had uh, a hotel leaving the light on uh, for Jesus to come there. It was a lonely place. He didn't have anyone to turn and say, hey, man, it's getting kind of rough. I, uh, I've, I've been on this fast for 14 days. But do you think you could take about a day or two for me so I could eat a little something and then, then we'll switch back? I've heard of people doing that before, passing their fast off to somebody else because they, they needed a little bit of re- a break from their fast. I guess that's break fast. Wait. No. We have them every morning. That was bad. But the wilderness was a place of spiritual warfare. The wilderness is a place of spiritual warfare. And that's what Jesus is teaching us in this story. So let's consider the wilderness experience. Uh, How often the call and the initial anointing for purposeful ministry is followed by a wilderness encounter with the devil who will come to sift us, to try us, to probe us, to tempt us, otherwise prevent us from fulfilling our divine ordained mission. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but I've been and seen in since... I gave my heart truly to the Lord and seeking him with full passion. We would have an evangelist come in and glory would come down. Then a week full of revival. And it seemed like the Monday following that last night of revival, the bottom drops out and all hell breaks loose. All four tires on your car flat. Anything that could go wrong would go wrong. Has anybody experienced what I'm talking about? And it seemed like after we had that glorious mountaintop experience, the next day we were in the in the middle of the wilderness with the wild beasts. Amen. Um, And that's what this wilderness experience is teaching us. And that the devil comes to us in those moments to sift us, to try us, to probe us, to tempt us, to actually cause us. I, I, I read as we were going through this spiritual abortion on God's divine plan for us. There is a, I'm careful with this word because some people take it and run with it like a football trying to make a touchdown, but we have a God-given destiny. Each one of us, we are destined for greatness in the kingdom of God. And Satan comes to tempt us, to cause us to fall short uh, of our God-given destiny. There are men of God who are so greatly used of, of the power and the anointing with discernment and ability to preach and just be used of God so greatly that are not in ministry today. Some are alcoholic. Some are uh, strung out on drugs. They've got other problems. Some have problems with with uh, uh, extramarital relationships and lost their ministry. And it wasn't because they were perfect. It was because they had a mountaintop experience and they, they weren't prepared for their wilderness. And in their wilderness, among the wild beasts, the devil come to tempt them. And he found a flaw in their flesh and they failed God. If you know somebody like that, pray for them. They, they, yes, they're still God's man. They should be living a higher standard but they're still man and they have the capacity just like you and I to fail. We're talking about the wilderness and spiritual spiritual warfare. Jesus encountered a head-to-head spiritual warfare of the most serious and consequential t- uh, kind. Satan come at Jesus uh, at, at very three strategic places. Uh, uh, the, the, the John talks about the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. It's in this story. We're going to address that here in a little bit. But here are some key observations about this wilderness. I don't think I put them on the slides, but it should be in your handouts there. Um, Before Jesus defeated Satan on the cross, he first defeated Satan in the wilderness. We all are going to have our wilderness experiences. We're going to have those times that are just difficult seemingly for us to walk through. There was a clash here of spiritual kingdoms. It was a duel between Jesus, the Lord of Lords, and Satan, the prince of this world. Uh, the other, another key observation is for Jesus, it was a time of crisis. I know I've mentioned him often, but the, the principles in that study experience Experiencing God, we did 17 years ago. Just keep coming back to me, and and in that study, it says that God 
will invite us to become involved with him in his work. And when he does, that invitation to join God in his work will lead us to a crisis of belief, that crisis of belief, it will challenge our, our, our faith and it will require much faith and it will require action on our part to be able to follow God. Sometimes God's leading will lead us through a valley, through a wilderness. The first Adam, he had a perfect world, he had a perfect garden, he had dominion over, the, over all uh, of the earth, but in that beautiful, plentiful, perfect environment, the first Adam failed when facing the serpent. But the last Adam, the Bible calls him Jesus as a son of man, had the challenge to succeed against the serpent without any food and without benefit of human camaraderie. I don't know how it affects you when you fast, and I don't know how it is when you fast, what you fast, but there are times I have shut out all food and beverage except water. And I do all right for about a day. The second day, uh, the lack of uh, good old southern sweet tea and coffee starts kicking in. My head feels like it's about this big. Anybody know what I'm talking about? After day three, that kind of goes away. Day four, then it starts working on you. You start, everything looks good. You think you can gnaw the side off of the television. And, and the longer you fast, the more things that, you, things that you didn't even like before. Raw oysters, man. You're just like, man, if I could just get me uh, some, I'll, I'll suck them straight out of the shelf. I, is anybody experience what I'm talking about? Satan will come at us in our times of spiritual preparation to get us to fall off course from where God is trying to get us, where God is trying to take us. Uh, a, a few weeks ago, I shared what I believe is God direction and vision for our church and and from uh, just a few weeks ago till now you wouldn't believe how the enemy has already tried to cause confusion and miscommunication it's the devil we're walking through a time we're trying to get where God wants us and what he wants to do Satan is to get us in that wilderness catch us off guard and cause us to short circuit God's plan for our lives amen the first Adam fell into sin in an environment that was perfect and harmonious, but the last Adam maintained his sinlessness in the midst of hostility. Another key, uh, key point to bring out is, uh, in his private confrontation with Satan, Jesus demonstrates that his mission is to do the will of the Father by destroying the works of the devil. To do this, he must, as a man, overcome the power of the devil. Uh, devil. Hebrews 4.15 says that we have a high priest. He's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. That means everything we go through that brings affliction to us spiritually, emotionally, mentally, uh, physically, whatever it might be, monetarily, or whatever it is, Jesus suffered what he suffered in all points, like as we are, are tempted, yet he did it without sin. He was our role model. Jesus paved the way. And, and when we look back into history, when we read the scriptures and look back and we see what he did for us, and uh, people say, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And you're not a sinner anymore. You are a saint, the Bible calls you. We have been saved by grace. Yes, but we're not that person anymore. Old things have passed away. We're a new person in Jesus Christ. See, the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness and Satan met him there. And so the Holy Spirit will lead us into places. It's for our spiritual growth. It's for our spiritual development. But if we will hang on, even though we're facing those satanic bombardments, we're going to be stronger on the other side of our wilderness, the other side of our desert, the other side of our cloudy skies, our stormy days. Amen. See, the wilderness is a place of temptation. Uh, Satan came as the tempter. Satan came as the tempter. It's his job to tempt us. Uh, I, I, let's just classify it. He's the tempter. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. And he will accuse you. He will bring up your past. He will tell you God doesn't love you. It's his job to accuse us. And it's his purpose in that to uh, tempt us to just fall off the wagon. To feel like, well, you know what? I kind of feel like God doesn't love me. I, I, 
you know what? I think if I feel this way, that must be how it really is. And, and so we move out of faith into working off our emotions and how we're feeling. Did you know you can have one too many cups of coffee and you'll be feeling all sorts of stuff that's not real? You can get you a little bit too much hydrocodone and you'll be seeing things and hearing things. Uh, we can be influenced by things that we put in our body. An imbalance of the, me the metabolism in our body can cause us to experience things. And Satan can play off of those things. We can't base it off of how we feel. It's important for us to try to remove our emotion, if you will, and work off our faith, live off the faith that, that God has given us. Um, I, I, I kind of sort of re, redid my notes to go along with that. Are you able to follow me okay with what you got there? Okay, praise the Lord. The Greek word for temptation, and I hope I get this right, is periazo, and that means to test, to scrutinize, to examine, to prove, to tempt, and to try. Uh, Satan was attempting to see what Jesus was made of. Um, I want to call it, I believe one time I was talking to Brother Billy Johnson about aircraft cable, and, and, and uh, this may not be the cor correct word for that, but the tensile strength is a word that you can use to test the strength of various things. There's various types of uh, fishing uh, line that you can get. Some was called gorilla braid. Some's called spider wire. We've got spider wire holding up the, it looked like they're floating in midair, but spider wire is holding up these microphones up here. Because it's a strong, and, it, and, and, and you can't break it with your hands. Or maybe you can, I can't. And then there's some, the, the real cheapo stuff you can buy at Walmart you can break with your hands. Fishing line I'm talking about, but tensile strength. Satan comes against us to test our tensile strength in our faith in God. How much do you truly love him? You remember Job? And Satan said, you, you've got him covered. You've got him hedged in. If you release me, I'll show you he'll curse you. And we read through the whole book. And he had some low moments and he had some struggles, but Job never turned his back on God. Satan was testing the tensile strength of this man of God. When we get on the other side, we have whipped the devil and the glory of God is seen in our life and we can climb up to the next limb and experience God's greatness on that limb. Amen. Praise the Lord. Y'all messing with me and I'm going to preach and get off my notes. That word uh, periazo comes from the root word piera or piera and it means a piercing through. Therefore, temptation is something that pierces through us to examine all the way to our heart. And Jesus gave us a scripture. It's not in your text, but you remember. And he talked about it's not what goes into a man that defiles a man, but what comes out of a man. And in that, in that frame of, of scriptural teaching, Jesus said, for, for, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It flows from in here out. And someone has a, um, a habit, if you will, uh, a, a tendency to just blurt things off and they're constantly hurting people's feelings, there's something wrong on the inside. Now, I'm not saying there's not times because we're not feeling good or some just, something's just out of sorts that, that we uh, just get out of the way with somebody. But then we go back to them like the Bible says. When we go to the altar to pray, we realize there's all between us and our brother. We go to them, we correct it. A piercing through, it's what's in the heart. He was looking for a weakness or a flaw so that he might cause Jesus to commit spiritual abortion on the mission before it was brought to full term. The existence of millions of born-again believers is tangible proof to the fact that Satan did not find any weakness in Jesus. If Jesus had given in to any one of those temptations then you and I would have no hope today. We had a young man that went to church with Billy and I when we were at Farmville. Young man went off to a, another school and came back. Still believed in Jesus, but he made a statement once that, that disturbed me even as a teenager that it didn't matter if Jesus rose from the dead as long as we knew that he died for us. But him rising from the dead was important it fulfilled scripture. It gave us victory over death and hell. There's a whole process of what Jesus went through 
to give us the life in Christ we have today. Part of that process is you got to go through your wilderness. But I'm going to let you know on the other side is an oasis of glory and power and presence. And we read in the scriptures that Jesus, the Bible says, when he, the angels ministered to him, he came out of the wilderness that he returned in the power of of the spirit now i'm not saying for us to jump out in the yard and let's just you know beat on our chest and say hey devil come get me that's not what i'm talking about in, in testing the devil but what but i i wonder sometimes if the devil's not bothering us it may be because we're not really shaking his kingdom and doing what we're called to do um the the, the scripture says that the early church and they had the testimony those that turned the world upside down was their testimony and uh, I feel God in that church because God has called us to be filled with his Holy Spirit. And if he chooses to speak through us in tongues, that's fine. If he chooses to work through us in the gifts of the Spirit, that's fine. But he has called us to be bold in our witness and share our faith and not be afraid to share. Because as we share, we're, we are doing our part to get the gospel out there and rescue others that are in their dark darkened wilderness that they are experiencing. Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Jesus takes the offensive. Um, the writer of our study says, consider Gettysburg. Gettysburg was a turning point uh, in the American Civil, should be Civil War. Uh, Robert E. Lee had ordered his generals to avoid this area of conflict because he wouldn't have chosen this as a key battleground. He already foresaw in his strategic thinking as a war general, that's not going to be a key location for us to win this thing. But it happened anyway. Uh, the, the skirmish escalated. It became more than the forces of Lee could handle. And ultimately, Lee was defeated and the rest is history. Satan wasn't expecting Jesus to take the offensive that he took in the wilderness. He doesn't expect us when he comes against us with things that we battle in our wilderness. He doesn't expect us to in return to put our faith in God. Yet he slay me, yet will I serve him. He doesn't expect us to turn the TV off and say, look, it's a tough time. So I'm just going to pray right now instead of looking. I, you know what? I'm going through a rough time. So I think I'm going to fast the next three days till I hear from God. He doesn't expect us. That's taking the offensive when we take the word of God out and start reading it more rather than licking our wounds and feeling sorry for ourselves when we are in the wilderness. Consider Gettysburg. The devil is not expecting us to take the offensive. Here's a greater historical turning point. The Lord of hosts, the King of kings, Jesus the Christ. He was baptized in water, baptized in the Holy Spirit, thrust into ministry. And when he went into the wilderness to fast 40 days and 40 nights, he took an offensive against the devil. Jesus chose the time and he chose the place for the direct warfare against Satan. Fasting and prayer are weapons in the in the hand, the arsenal of the child of God to defeat the devil. And so we may be hungry and we may get a headache. We may struggle for a few days as we're fasting, but understand there's a greater glory on the other side of the sacrifice. If we would just maintain and hold on when we get to the other side of the sacrifice, there is an anointing coming to you because you trusted God. Amen. Y'all, I know I'm not like ripping the chandeliers down, but I feel Jesus in this place. The Lord wanted us to preach this lesson, this series on spiritual warfare, fighting the good fight of faith. Somebody needed to hear. Maybe it's not this crowd here. Maybe it's those folks that we keep picking up on our live stream. We're getting people from Virginia and Florida, Washington State that are watching our live stream. Maybe they've been, there's some that's been texting me from a Florida area code. I don't even know who they are and they're texting and I can tell they're listening. So if you're listening to us tonight, God is speaking to you. Hang on in your wilderness and you're going to get the glory and the victory for it. I just wanted to tell you that I feel the Lord in this place. 
He didn't allow Satan to dictate the strategy. He went into the wilderness under the direction of the Holy Spirit. And he knew that he went there under the direction of the Holy Spirit and going to leave him abandoned out there. And there are times we feel the Holy Spirit moving in our lives and there's times we wonder where he is, but he's not gone anywhere. We're in the wilderness during those times. Just hang on. There's an anointing on the backside of that wilderness. Just hang on. He chose to take the offensive, Jesus did, in the midst of enemy territory. It's the wilderness with desolate, solitary place, with wild beasts, and a place of devils. And Jesus took the offensive against his enemies. See, the Jews considered the wilderness an abode of demons. The Dictionary of New Testament Theology states the wilderness is a place of deadly danger, of demonic powers, where demonic dangers threaten. In Matthew 12, 43, the Bible speaks of unclean spirits. Jesus talks about unclean spirits passing through dry places. You remember reading about that? Uh, and let me insert this right here. The person who had his house cleaned out and swept and garnished, the Bible talks about. You remember that? And the spirit comes back and doesn't find that the house has been filled up with something else that he goes and gets demons seven times stronger than he, and they come back in the, the shape, the condition of that person is worse than their first condition. You remember that? This, this is what we're talking about here. Unclean spirits going out in dry places. Satan loves dry places. That's where he works. That's why it's important that we continually drink from the spiritual water of life daily. The New Testament paints that picture in Matthew 12, 43. Jesus understood the nature of the wilderness. You know what? He was responsible for creating the wilderness. Jesus took the battle to Satan's turf. I remember hearing, I gotta, I'm, I'm going to keep it in my notes. <laughs> I got to quit doing that. Keep bouncing off of it. Oh, Bocher comments, Jesus reveals his glory in the desert, his victory over demonic powers. Only where God's judgment has fallen is their victory over the desert and its maleficent spirits. In the wilderness, in the toughest place you will ever find yourself, Jesus gained the victory. And he did that so we've got a life-related situation, a biblical example of in our deepest, darkest, worst, nightmarish place in our life and we think we can't even breathe. In that moment, there is victory to be had. There is still light at the end of the tunnel. Amen. There's still a bright day coming at the end of our night. The scripture talks about there being weeping through the night, but what? Joy comes in the morning, there is victory on the other side of your wilderness. A few hundred years before Jesus, David ran out in his wilderness. It was called a valley. And he dropped Goliath on the field of warfare. Now we see Jesus in the wilderness of temptation and without hesitation <clears throat> for a power encounter which prepares the way for his earthly ministry. Listen, it prepared the way for his earthly ministry and displays his non-failing commitment to do the will of the Father. Keep reading here. Satan met Adam in a beautiful garden and perverted God's word of truth and man fell. Jesus met Satan in a desolate wilderness and defeated him with the word of God. I said this the other week, but not only did he defeat him in the wilderness, uh, Jesus beat the devil with the ugly stick and it's called the cross. Jesus beat the devil with the ugly stick and it's called the cross. Uh, that, that song Carmen did, the champion talks about how Satan just, he had him, he had him down. There's a couple, two or three songs he had and he, he thought he had him beat. You know, he's in the grave. Grave, you still got him in there? Yeah, man, don't worry about it, old Big D. We, our, our, our name, uh, he's still intact. Uh, he, the stone's in front of him. He's not going anywhere, but he still rose from the dead. Amen. Amen. It was a spiritual sword. Satan was twisting the word of God in a sword fight against the living word. And Jesus utilized the power of the truth from God's word to cut down Satan's blows. He used the truth and the genuineness of God's word to uh, overthrow the distorted use of God's word. I read somewhere, and it may have been in this study, there are so many cults today 
in occults that are based off of phrases and phraseologies and portions of scriptures where men abuse and misuse certain portions of the word of God and build a religion off of, but they are not Christian. They have misused the word of God. Jesus was driven by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. Matthew and Luke, he was led there. But Mark states he was driven by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. That word driven is ekbalo, ekbalo in the Greek. And it means to throw out, to put forth, to send away. In Matthew eight sixteen, we see where Jesus was casting out demons. That's just one location. But we read throughout the Gospels where Jesus consistently throughout his ministry cast out demons. And uh, Matthew 21 and 12, Jesus made that cord of rope. And what did he do? He cast out the money changers, and uh, they had made the house of prayer, the house of the Father, a den of thieves. That is uh, ekbalo, casting out, driving out. And uh, Jesus was, with that same thought process on the positive, he was driven. He was driven there by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus didn't fulfill, uh, forfeit his will to follow the Holy Spirit. See, uh, it, people uh, feel like that uh, you lose your personality when you get saved and you get filled with the Holy Spirit. No, he deals with the bad stuff that we used to be and, and makes us a new man. But we, we're, I'm still JD. And uh, in the disc profile, the dominant, the influencing, the conscientious, uh, the, the, uh, the steady personality, we still have those. But the Holy Spirit takes our personality and where we have weaknesses and we lean on the Holy Spirit, he takes those weaknesses and builds them into our strengths when we allow ourselves to be utilized by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads believers into new areas. However, we should never hold God responsible for when we're tempted because God doesn't tempt us to sin. The wilderness temptation was a part of God's divine plan. Therefore, the Christian should understand this. Amen? Uh, the next slide, I believe, says new levels brings new devils. New levels brings new devils. Uh, we uh, grow in our faith. We grow in our trust in God. We, we grow and mature as, as Christian believers. And when we do, then new levels brings new devils. Um, no, I got to keep focused. I had an illustration. I got to keep focused. As God takes believers to higher levels of faith, maturity, and faithfulness and authority, the powers of hell send stronger spiritual attacks against him. In Ephesians chapter 6, uh, we, we, we wrestle against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness of this age and spiritual wickedness in high places. There's at least four levels of demonic forces there. There are levels. Uh, there's some that will say that there's not, but yes, there, there are. There are fallen angels that follows Satan. He can't be everywhere, so he sends little imps, um, uh, little demiurges, which are called little demons, little uh, devils out to try to aggravate and irritate and tempt us to fall into sin. Here's what I, what I like about this. Even though believers have many traps in plans of lesser demons, they must be aware that with maturity comes greater warfare. However, the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit to aid us becomes stronger in our lives as we grow in Him. You know, I, I, I've known people before, their understanding of the working of the Holy Spirit in their life was limited to the choir just sang a song that was imported or meant something to them. It tied to something emotional. They get stirred. They begin to cry. They yield to God. They, they began to move into the Holy Spirit at that level of their understanding. But then I've met people who have served God for a long time and their passion and understanding for the Holy Spirit is so deep. And, and they walk and talk with the Holy Spirit just like I'm talking to you right now. They have such a relationship with him. So as the, the attacks of the enemy, the works of the devil come against us, maybe in stronger ways as we mature, 
so does the influence and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit grow in our lives greater and move beyond where we used to be. It's more than a hucklebuck and a shake and, a, and Lord, it, it, it wouldn't hurt us to do a little bit more of that uh, to, to remind ourselves we're still Pentecostal around here. But when our feet hit the ground and we're through doing the helicopter and running around and we go out there, we are still walking in the spirit and still influenced by him. He influences what we see and what we're listening to and influences what comes out of our mouth. Oh, church, that we would just trust him for the witness that he wants to bubble up out of us. He wants to spring out of us and the people he wants to bring into the kingdom to the Garner Church of God. We're not a storehouse for the harvest on accident. We are a Holy Spirit filled Garner, our storehouse, barn for the harvest. And if we'll trust the Holy Spirit, he's going to bring them in. Amen. Yes, I keep getting off the notes. And Sister Ellen, she's going to get me in a little bit. Jesus operated in the power of the Spirit. 